Well, we are live, and uh, we didn't hear the applaud, and we didn't see the screen, but uh, as we said, it's been that kind of day, and for some of us, it's been that kind of year. Well, he hello, everyone. I'm Mike. I'm Matt. And we are the uh, Mind Your Own Business with Mike and Matt. <laughs> I'll try that again. And we are Mind Your Own Business with Mike and Matt Vodcast. So, hello, everyone. Our plan today is to interview business owners and entrepreneurs Ask them a few questions that we hope will be helpful for you, our viewers and listeners who want to be inspired and want to learn how you can be better business owners and entrepreneurs yourselves. Our goal is to come up with one good business nugget each time. And so today we have two very special women who are joining us whose businesses have certainly been impacted by COVID-19. And I just want to say on a personal note, they are really very special. So first, I'd like to introduce Karen LaRosa. Karen is, uh, her firm is called La Rosa Works Sicily Tours and Travel. It is a boutique tour operating company, customizing with hands-on tours for Sicily for small and medium-sized groups. She emphasizes cultural and educational immersion right from the planning stage, making the travel experience very rich, satisfying, and memorable. She also plans local events that highlight Sicily's rich culture. And just, uh, to, review, to reveal something, actually, Karen has planned a trip to Sicily for me in the past, and I can attest to you it was pretty wonderful. Karen? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So, Matt, would you introduce Evan? Sure. Um, Evan runs uh, Fable and Lark, a storied adventures uh, business, which offers interactive museum tours inspired by great stories, which are currently running virtually. She has developed these tours to look at the intersection between art and stories, as, as well as to add an interactive twist to the museum experience. She's interested in looking at connections among different kinds of art, as well as the kinds of classic stories that have been read for hundreds of years. Welcome to you both. Welcome again. And so Karen and, and Evan, we're gonna tag team mm -hmm. a bunch of questions. But first, uh, Karen, would you please introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you both for having me here. Um, we have both a professional and a personal relationship, and I'm really glad to do this with you. Um, I, as you said, you gave me the introduction, so I don't need to repeat any of that. Um, I'll just tell you that I've been passionate about Sicily since I was small. And uh, after the, my first visit, I was just uh, in, in love and in awe and felt a very deep personal connection to my ancestral roots. And so that's, that's how that all um, started. I'm you know, 12 years into the game and uh, it's more than a business. It's, it's really something that I do from the heart and uh, love doing. Um, and so, yeah, it's been a tough year. Well, we'll get to that. Are you Sicilian, by the way? Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, there you go. so uh, I don't think you're Sicilian. So tell us a little bit as to what you do. Um, I run a small business, as Matt explained, that looks at great stories through the lens of museum experiences. I love museums and I love stories, and I was fortunate to find a way to connect the two of them. As Karen said, it's been a hard year for a number of reasons, obviously, something hopefully we are coming to the end of and something that I hope we can talk about a little bit today. Great. So uh, since this is the Mike and Matt show and <laughs> we're a tag team uh, with questions, so Matt, why don't you start? Sure. So uh, Karen, um, a few, a couple of questions. How did you start your business? Uh, did you see a need in the market, or was it something that you wanted to do or needed to do? Uh, well, well, I didn't need to do it. It was um, kind of something that just happened. You know, kind of the kids were gone, and it was time to reinvent myself. And lots of things came together at the right time to make me make this decision, but a lot of it was serendipitous. Um, I've always been the organizer of our group of friends who've traveled college friends every year for 30 years. I've always done the trips. Um, after the trip to Sicily, which was, um, you know, as I said, it was before 12 years ago, whatever it was now, um, 
uh, people just started asking me about going. And I started, left Sicily and said, I'm coming back here like right away. And I've been back at least two or three times a year ever since. Um, and so people started asking me to plan trips. And then I uh, kind of like baptism by fire, uh, I was singing with the New York Choral Society at the time. And they, it was their annual trip. Uh, I was on the travel committee, it was no surprise where we were going. <laughs> and so I did a trip for 130 people, including three concerts and all kinds of special um, activities and events and things. And it was, you know, I'm not patting myself on the back, but there, it was flawless and it was fabulous. And right from that trip, I got all kinds of referrals and trips for people who wanted to go back. And anyway, so it just started building from there and it has continued to build and I've never advertised. It's all word of mouth. So I, I have to confess, I was also on a tour with Karen in Sicily, and it was unbelievable. We uh, all we all so, work together. <laughs> so, uh, Evan, similar questions to you. Uh, why did you start your business, and did you see a need in the market, and uh, did you want to do it, or did you feel like you needed to do it? I saw the need in the market after I started my business, so <laughs> that's not necessarily uh, the way it should or is supposed to happen. But my story in some ways is not dissimilar to Karen's. I had a lot of museum experience. I'd worked in a museum for many, many years. I had a master's degree. I had gone to graduate school in English literature and I left the museum in which I was working um, for a number of reasons. I'd had a wonderful experience, seemed like it was time to do something new. Couldn't really figure out what that was. I studiously avoided doing anything with museums after I'd worked in one because I couldn't really figure out what that meant. I couldn't think of anything new to bring to the party. There are a lot of wonderful groups who offer tours, who do museum programs. Museums themselves do a fabulous job. I just had nothing. I felt like I had nothing new to add. And then kind of like Karen, through a variety of sort of serendipitous experiences, I started doing a lot of research into the way people visited and explored museums. I tend to research heavily anything I'm going to do, whether it's a business or a trip to the dentist. So I did a lot of a lot of research. I started going on a lot of tours of different kinds. I started looking at a lot of information on how people explored museums, what their experiences were like. And I couldn't find a lot of material on on more interactive kind of experiential museum tours. It doesn't mean that there weren't any, it just means that I personally was not coming across a lot of those kind of experiences. And I thought, huh, this is an idea. I don't know if it's a good idea or a bad idea, but it's an idea. At the time, I was not thinking of it as a career. I was more thinking of it as something to do while I figured out my next career move. So in a funny way, I was in one of those places where you kind of feel like you have nothing to lose. I didn't feel like anything was riding on it because it wasn't a career move. It was just sort of a thing I was doing. So I, I kind of felt like I could throw caution to the wind and do what I wanted. I thought I'm going to just do this the way I feel like doing it. I'm going to move at my own pace. I'm going to explore the works of art the way I want. I'm going to make the kind of connections the way I feel like. And in a way that was very freeing. I didn't have that burden or that responsibility. And it turned out to be fortunate. It turned out to be something that kind of made use of a lot of my different skill sets, which was lucky. And while I'd originally thought of it as something for families, it turned out to be something that appealed to a lot of different groups of people. And I was fortunate in being able to take that initial idea and grow it into a larger business. So it's actually- sort of, sort of very exciting. You learned, like you were, do, you were doing things you, the way you wanted to do it. And exactly. Business, and business happened. Exactly. Yeah. And that's obviously very fortunate, very serendipitous and absolutely nothing I planned for. In fact, I feel like if I'd planned for it, it probably would not have happened or certainly happened. And then the same kind of thing happened with me because, you know, when I started this, there were a lot of, you know, big tours that went out, big bus tours and, and that kind of thing that did not just Sicily, they did all over the place. But when I came around, 
you know, I had my idea of how I wanted people to see the island. And it was a very particular, exactly. it was really going deep into the heart and soul of a place, yes. small, intimate with local people. And so I was sort of on the cutting edge, even though I had no idea about that. I was just following my heart. And now the whole trend is towards those kinds of tours. You know, the right. big bus tours are really losing uh, appeal because people, not because of the virus, but because of, you know, people want to experience things in a, in a way that they hadn't before. I think that word experience is super yeah. important, right? Everything is now quote unquote experiential. Yeah. And I think both of us kind of did that early on. And I do have to say one of the things that, that spurred me on and Karen, I don't know if this is true for you as well, but Karen and I were in a group of women entrepreneurs, which I found very inspiring. I had joined the group and I had invited Karen to join and we did that for several years actually and i think it was exactly the right kind of group at the right time right. one of the things that you need right is you need other people kind of pushing you and mm -hmm. encouraging you that's sort of you know both encouraging you and pushing you i think both saying yes you can do this but in the other breath but how are you going to do this what are right. you going to do yeah it was right. challenging you to think right. about the things yeah exactly absolutely. No, and I, I don't know if i would have done it without that sort of momentum of people you know if i just been sitting alone in my room for six months i don't think i would have had that push that that i needed you know because there were people who were saying i kept saying oh i'm not ready and people were saying just go out and do it you're never going to be quote unquote ready just do it and i found that actually one of the major forces in getting me off the ground so you know it's it's uh, interesting to hear both your stories because uh, matt and i often talk about the accidental business owner and we work with the accidental business owner. It's, it's you know, I'm an accidental business owner. Uh, Matt's an accidental business owner as well. We wake up one morning and we say, gee, I don't think I want to do it this way. I want to do it my way. And, uh, you know, we wind up doing it. And, and then quite frankly, um, we may not know what exactly we're doing, but we find out trial by error, trial by fire. We find out, we find our way and, uh, you know, testament to the two of you and of course to any number of people who are listening uh, so many people are accidental business owners so we're going to move along because I, I want to actually ask both of you and I'm going to ask first uh, Karen and then Evan you know typically we'll say what do you do during what are you doing differently during the pandemic what are your biggest issues what is your plan to resolve them and uh, we'll have one more question with that so uh, let's start with Karen so Karen you know, you've been in the trap. You're in the travel business. Who's traveling? Nobody. So, nobody. <laughs> so, what what have you been doing different during the pandemic? Well, after I finished, you know, writing a million refund checks because the last two years were just really, really uh, so busy, um, and there were a lot of trips planned for 2020. You know, I had to kind of take a deep breath and say, "All right, well, what am I going to do?" Um, obviously this isn't happening for a while. We didn't know how long, but I, I have to kind of keep myself alive. I have to keep myself in the spotlight. I have to keep Sicily in the spotlight so that when people have, you know, the pandemic off their minds, they can think about traveling again. And I want them to travel with me. I want, you know, I did hold on to you know, deposits from people who said, we're just going to reschedule, don't worry about this and all that. But still, you know, it's a big world out there and they have a lot of options. So what was I going to do? Well, one of the things that really suffered when I was so busy um, was marketing because I was so busy doing the tours themselves and the details of all that, that I really didn't have much time to to write, to to really think. I mean, I posted on social media every day, but it wasn't um, that content heavy. And I didn't investigate other places and other people. So I decided that that had to be part of my, uh, what I was going to do. Um, and I did, I started looking around and reaching out to people and um, uh, I started writing. Uh, so I've written a bunch of articles for various publications, some about wine, some about travel. And I, uh, I was host, I uh, was a guest on some podcasts and, um, 
that was really wonderful too. It requires a lot of work. Uh, this one, you know, with you, I can speak just very, it's about business and it's about what I do every day. So that's different than having to speak about, you know, the Baroque architects of the Valdinotto. So those kinds of things require a lot of research. And, uh, but it was fun. It was good to do it. And, and I got a lot of great feedback from that. So reaching out was, was a very uh, important thing. And of course, that means growing the mail list with those people and hopefully the people who read those articles and the people who listen to those podcasts will eventually think about travel. So that was the game plan for that. Then I decided I wanted, you know, everybody was in this virtual mode. Um, and I wasn't really keen on the idea of hosting like cooking classes and things like that, because they're a lot, a lot of work uh, for very little kind of return. I mean, you make people happy, which is ultimately the return. But um, I decided I was going to create uh, a YouTube channel. And on that YouTube channel, I was going to offer whether they were interviews or videos or different ways that people could experience a slice of life of Sicily, all done on a budget of zero. Um, but I have a, you know, a lot of friends over there. I have 86,000 photos of my own. I know people. So together for each different video, I had different people involved and we all just did it as a kind of a community effort to um, promote and Sicily's best side. And uh, and it was, it's was it been a lot of fun. I mean, it was a pandemic project, but I, I think I will hopefully try to keep it going forward. Um, and even more than the people here who have given great feedback is the people in Sicily. You know, you, you, you highlight some, you know, woman who lives in a rural little place and is making bread the traditional way in her stone oven, these people are over the moon that somebody recognized the value of what they're doing. So that's been kind of very gratifying to me. It's great. And, you know, and then I do my monthly newsletters, which I wasn't doing before. And those are kind of key. So and, and in like, those, I'm sorry. It sounds like you're doing quite a, dip, a bit of yeah, things. I'm, I've been, I'm busy, <laughs> not with tours, but I'm busy. That's good. Evan, so what have you been doing differently during the pandemic? Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So I think like many people who have jobs or who had jobs that did not transition easily to a virtual space, uh, the first thing I did was panicked. I was completely, completely panicked. I literally had no idea what to do. And then I moved into the seven stages of panic, which kind of went to panic, to numbness. Seven stages to of panic. <laughs> seven. So I really didn't know what to do. And I initially the idea of converting my tours to virtual experiences honestly didn't really occur to me because my tours are extremely interactive that's one of the major selling points i just i just didn't understand how that was possible and then i was sort of push, pushed into the space because i had a client who had paid for one of my in-person experiences and said hey we've paid for this do you want to try to do a virtual version and i could have given them the money back, I suppose, but I said, okay. So I started converting one of my programs to a virtual version and I found it very, very difficult. I will not lie at first, I found it very, very hard to to recreate the experience. And I and then I realized you can't recreate the experience. You have to create an entirely new experience. You're not gonna be able to duplicate what you have in the gallery. So I shifted my thinking, which I think for me was key. I started, I'd been thinking initially, I'm doing this instead of my tours. And then I thought, no, I'm doing this in addition to my tours. One day I will do my tours again the way they're meant to be. But for right now, I'm giving people a completely different kind of experience in the same way that when I launched my tours, I was giving them a different kind of experience. That really shifted my perspective and my thinking a lot. I stopped feeling like I was doing a poor imitation of what I'd done in the galleries and started thinking of it as something completely new. And that for me, was really key. So I approached it differently. I started trying to take advantage of the things that you can only do 
virtually. There are lots of things you can do that you can't. You can access more materials, right? You're not limited to one particular space. You can do trivia, you can do games, you can utilize all the different functions of whatever program you are using. So I tried to embrace that rather than to be resentful of it. So that was actually really important for me. And then something I've been thinking about doing for a while was kind of programs that were offshoots of those. You know, my, I love stories. My tours are inspired by stories. So I started doing book clubs, writing groups. I started kind of looking at the logical extensions of that. Again, something you can do in a virtual space because you can gather people from literally all over the world. And again, just, I think for me, it was really a shift in perspective and not trying to recreate, but trying to create something new. It's great. Thank you both. These are very, very interesting. And uh, Matt, you, you've got a few questions, and then, of no. course, we'll get to the heart of it. So, so um, Karen, a um, few questions for you. Uh, how do you make decisions for your business? And, um, and how, what keeps you from making a, a particular decision? Um, you know, like Evan, I pretty much try to do my research about things. Um, and, I, and, you know, when you work for yourself and, uh, you know, you're a, a small company, you have to value, you have to <coughs> evaluate everything. Um, so looking at different things and weighing them against my own philosophy of how I like to do this, yep. um, I, you know, I started off very hands on and having very intimate relationships with people. And I know there are shortcuts and different ways that I could save time and maybe be more efficient by, you know, there are a lot of these uh, companies now that will give you kind of itineraries that you just write the name of something in there and it auto fills all this stuff. And, but then everybody's got a very similar looking itinerary. Mine is a very personal thing. You know, you'll want to go here because I know you love ceramics or you'll want to do this because of that. So, uh, you know, I have to weigh each and everything. Um, you know, insurance was a non-starter. We have insurance and we pay for that. And, you know, so you have to just, I have to look at everything in terms of how it matches with my philosophy, which I'm pretty pig-headed about, and um, and obviously the costs involved in, in those kinds of things, uh, and sort of the long-term value of it as well. You know, sure. where am I going? How do you, Karen? How do you know you made a mistake? Um, well, to be perfectly honest, I haven't made a tremendous number of them, but I think the biggest mistake in this business comes from not listening or not hearing what your clients are saying. So um, when you're doing something custom, every tour has to start from scratch. There's nothing you can just, you know, say, okay, well, this is the itinerary. I'll just send them that. Everything, you know, this group wants horseback riding. That one wants to go to wineries. This one wants to do yoga. It all starts from, from, uh, from that. So I have to listen very carefully to what they want to do and arrange something with their expectations set correctly. You know, you're not going to be galloping on the beach, but you'll be with a small group of horses that can go walk on, you know, the, the local area. So it's all about that. It's managing expectations and it's, it's trying to listen. I, you know, I wasn't being like, flip or facetious. Fortunately, I think I've been pretty good at that. Um, but that's that's the challenge because you're really working intimately. And, you know, people think, oh, it's just a trip. How many trips do you get a year? How many times do you get to travel to, to Europe? You know, for most people, this is a really big, it's a big, important time, you know, for them. Yeah, and a lot of money. So. Okay. Sure. So, Evan, um, same questions. How do you make decisions for your business? And what might keep you from making a decision? So I think there's a pre-pandemic answer and a during pandemic <laughs> answer. Um, I think that I think there's short and long term thinking. I think that there are things that you do that get you through the short term. And then I think that there's also long term planning. I think during the pandemic, as I said, you just need an attitude shift. You have to do what you do for now. And then it's very hard to make decisions for the long term at the moment. You just have to assume that we're going to come out on the other side of this and that one way or another, we're going to get back to 
if not exactly where we were, but sort of a semblance and we'll be able to kind of make adjustments. I think decisions are based on what you see is working and what you see is not working. And I think when you're doing something that is so immediate and so hands-on and dealing with people, it's very easy to see what works and what doesn't work. I went through a phase where someone approached me about doing a very, very large tour, 150 people. Uh, and I, the museums don't even allow that, so it wasn't really an issue. And after this person approached me, I started thinking, this is what I should be doing. I should be doing these enormous tours. I should be reaching out to huge corporations. And then I woke up the next day and I thought, no, I shouldn't. I don't, I don't do that. I'm not going to, I wouldn't even know how to do that. That's not what I do. It's not what I'm about. It will completely dilute what I'm about. I think you have to keep your vision and your mission in the forefront and you have to do things that are working now and also kind of plan for the future. Good. How do you know when you make, you've made a mistake? So again, I think you know you've made a mistake, as I said, when you wake up the next morning in a cold sweat because you thought you could do a program for 150 people, when you kind of realize that the whole reason you started something was with a particular mission and a, con and a particular vision. I think, as Karen said, you have to know what you do well, why you're doing it, and mm -hmm to continue to do that. It's not that you shouldn't expand, it's not that you shouldn't move, make changes, but if you have a particular vision and you found a particular niche, I think you have to stay true to that. And I think when you don't is when you start making mistakes. Makes a lot of sense. You know, I'm picking up lots of golden nuggets, guys. It's very, <laughs> uh, you know, it's really very interesting. So actually I've taken notes as, as, as the two of you have spoken and, uh, so our next questions, and we'll just, uh, let's see. What are the most important lessons that you've learned being in business? And if there was any one golden nugget that you would give to someone, what would that be? So Evan, why don't we start with you? So I think, again, the pandemic has provided a different set of answers than we might have had before. So the pandemic has provided a one word answer, which is to adapt. I think it's crucial that you know how to adapt and that you assume you were going to be able to adapt. I think once I got over that initial panic and despair and numbness, I thought, well, I can either find a way to do this or I cannot find a way to do this. And once I thought about it that way, the answer was pretty clear. I was going to find a way to do this. So I think, again, keeping in mind that you're going to constantly have to adapt. And then, as I said, mm -hmm for a virtual space, you're not recreating what you were doing, you're just looking at it in a different way and you're offering a different kind of experience it is extremely important. Can you repeat the first, the second part of your question? Well, what is the most important lessons you've learned in business? Why and what's the one golden business nugget? But you've actually, you've said it. Mm -hmm. you've, Those are my nuggets. <laughs> Those are, that's, that's what I've learned. Very well, and I'm gonna repeat it. So for you, because it was really quite, Thank quite you straight on and really great advice. Karen, what's the most important lesson you've learned and why well, is your golden nugget? I'll, I'll jump on you know, what Evan said. You have to be flexible. You have to adapt within the framework of who you are and what you want to do. And I realized you know, when I started doing this marketing stuff and writing these newsletters, people didn't want to hear me drone on about Sicily. They wanted to know how they could connect. So each newsletter, I would give them three, four different ways to, you know, an online something or a TV show or a film to watch or something like that, because that's that's what I heard that they, they wanted. So I think that the golden nugget for me is you have to listen and you have to, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to not sell something, but I am basically. I'm selling an idea, a concept, a place. And I have to listen to the people who are traveling with me, what they want. And, and it's, I mean, this is about Sicily and it's about them. It's not about me. I happen to be the person bringing my knowledge and my years of experience to the table. But this is each one of these tours and each one of these things I do is about the people who are enjoying it. It's not about me. So I have to constantly just open myself up to tell me what you want. And whether it's a, you know, a, an event for a wine tasting, which I've done some of those online, or I did, you know, corporate, uh, like, virtual vacation in Sicily kind of thing. <clears throat> tell me what you want, and we'll make it happen. 
So it, it's fascinating. And I'm, I think I'm going to have to disappoint our viewers and listeners. You know why? Because I don't have one golden nugget to give them. I have a bunch. So <laughs> I've taken some good notes uh, from having listened to both of you, two fantastic accidental business owners who are no, more, no longer an accident for sure. And so here's, here's what I would say in terms of what I've heard and the golden nuggets. One is keep your vision in the forefront and stay true to your niche. And I think, Evan, I heard that very clearly from you. Another was I heard adapt. And you know what was interesting about that was assume you will adapt. Have the confidence and basically know that you will adapt. What I heard from Karen is, you know, friends and families and support and flexibility. And look, and I heard from both of you, look at the, your situation with new eyes. You know, it's different. Accept the difference. Look at it with new eyes. And then I heard, uh, listen to your audience. Hear, hear what your, targets, your target audience is saying. Listen to them. It doesn't necessarily mean that you give them everything they want because you still have to be true to your vision. You still have to focus on what you can do. But I really heard that from both of you. So, um, again, if you, for all of you who are listening, you didn't just get one today. You got a lot. So, so we hope you enjoyed the, vo the vodcast. Um, you can subscribe to Mind Your Own Business with Mike and Matt on our YouTube channel. You all, we also have a Facebook page. And you can also see us on uh, videosocials.net. And you can see Mike and Matt on our LinkedIn posts. So I want to thank you, Karen. I want to thank you, Evan. I'm Mike. I'm Matt. And together we are the Voices of Reason. And this has been another Mind Your Own Business vodcast with Mike and Matt. Stay wow. positive thank and you. test negative. And thank you all for watching. <laughs> thank, yeah. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.